la maestra Berturi, Belturi, eh, que nos, es especialista, ah, ya le vamos a contar un poco sobre ella, ella nos va a contar más. Y además contar con todos ustedes. Hoy tenemos también la presencia del maestro Walter eh, Reiter, que también es un especialista. Eh, veíamos ahora eh, eh, la portada de uno de los, de los libros que ha escrito sobre la ejecución también de la música barroca. Así que es un tema eh, que, que, que no se acaba. Es un tema que siempre eh, es un tema abierto, que genera discusiones eh, eh, muy interesantes. Así que, bueno, el presentador de hoy, el conductor de la reunión va a ser eh, El Mundo. Y como siempre, agradecerles a todos y esperar que disfruten eh, mucho esta, esta eh, charla de hoy. La maestra eh, Francesca, eh, ella nos va a contar a, eh, con detalle, pero es de origen italiano, estudia ahora en Frankfurt y ha hecho eh, muchos trabajos, estudios y lo, y lo más interesante, grabaciones, que a, a, escucharemos algún fragmento por ahí, ella nos va a contar más, un CD que tiene y que invitamos a todos a adquirir y a escuchar, está en YouTube y varias otras plataformas, eh, sobre eh, con obras, ¿verdad? Y, eh, y específicamente... Eh, que nos deja ver la ejecución y eh, la idea que ella tiene sobre y lo que ha trabajado sobre la ejecución histórica. Entonces, para todos, eh, igual agradecerles y es un tema, como digo, muy, muy interesante. Sí, agradecerle la bondad eh, a Francesca de estar con nosotros esta mañana, al mundo por ser, el, como siempre, el motor de este proyecto a don Walter y a todos los que estamos hoy eh, presentes, pues eh, invitarlos sábado a sábado para que estén eh, compartiendo estos temas. Entonces, el mundo, Francesca. Hello, everybody. Hola. Okay, <laughs> thank you and welcome everybody. Thanks to inviting me. And um, yes, so I start um, to play Baroque viola just um, because I really like the Baroque language. And um, I, the first uh, time that I really um, Um, decided to start to, to um, I mean, increase my knowledge about uh, Baroque. It was with the Bach suites, because every violist uh, has this wonderful opportunity during their study um, to study this sixth uh, cello suite. And um, I just um, bought me the manuscript of this, uh, as I was a modern viola student, um, I bought this um, copy of the manuscript of Anna Magdalena Bach and from a copist of Bach and, and other stuff. And I tried just to, to look at the manuscript and I try to imagine, oh, okay. I mean, I've not have to follow the, the edition, the modern edition, I can do also these layers like this or like this or like that. And so I start just to thinking at, 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 the, at the end, I did my own version of a box suite and I played for my professor, a modern professor. 
and he he was not really happy at the beginning <laughs> i have to say but uh, but he accept this uh, this attitude uh, with the time um and so that's <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, back, 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 back sweet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. It was wonderful. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. And I mean, I have to say my English is, unfortunately, it's not really good. Uh, <laughs> my German is better. <laughs> okay. So, um, so that's why why I start uh, to to um, to think about Baroque music because for me it was interesting the interesting way to express myself as a musician. Um, so I started to study really Baroque viola at the University in Frankfurt with uh, Petra Müllerjans. Um, she's a violinist teacher, uh, but she used also to 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 teach um, violist there. And so when I started, uh, I, I had really a dream at the beginning. So I really wanted uh, to show that uh, there is no just uh, um, orchestral, um, as a, that Baroque viola, it doesn't mean um, that you have just to play eighth in the orchestra or something like that. I wanted to um, researching also this uh, this repertoire and to found uh, find uh, a lot of uh, sonatas that uh, we can also play and enjoy. So I. <laughs> yes. Petra Müllerjans. <laughs> yes, what was great. And that's also why my CD is called More Than a Dal Ripieno. Um, because um, I, I read uh, in a presentation of uh, a sonata of William Flecton this, uh, this sentence. Um, he was a composer and a bookseller. Uh, living in Canterbury, and um, she, um, he, he wrote these uh, three solos for a viola. I mean, three for the tenor. Uh, that that was the, the the name of of who was called the the big violin, the the viola, and uh, also three for the cello. And he wrote there. I. I really want to compose something, write something uh, to demonstrate that uh, the viola as instrument is uh, more than just um, uh, uh, 
dal ripieno. Il ripieno è, um, um, I mean, in English, uh, but I mean, maybe you can understand because in Spanish it's not so, so uh, different. Ripieno è the, the, the okay, I can uh, explain. So ripieno is the, the rule that we have uh, when we play in orchestra. So we are just to fill it. <laughs> It's not like this, but but that's uh, so that's the sentence that uh, Flecton used to say. So and, and and so I I felt like this. Okay, that's that's perfect for me because I just what I I took at the beginning. So the the name of the city are canterbury canterbury Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I don't know how many of you are um, playing a Baroque instrument or have just a Baroque bow or, or just, um, I mean, tried to experiment uh, something. But um, for me at the beginning, I had uh, really bad viola because I didn't have so much money to buy another viola. So I use um, really not good viola, so a student viola. And I put, uh, maybe I don't have to explain that, but I put on the gut string. And, but I try at the beginning to play without uh, shield rest and without uh, chin in sure. or a chin rest, yeah, uh, in order to to have the possibility to learn from zero. So put everything off and let's let's try try it out. So I I was not judging me at the moment, just learning something. So. And I think the, the really must um, 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 the most um, important things that I learned is that the instrument uh, say you if you are right or wrong at the beginning. With uh, because if you have a gut string and you just push your and you just try to to play as a as as all we learned so as a modern modern musician so with uh, we are used to play with a lot of um, so no, i would not really say pression but if you put the modern bow on the on the normal strings you can just put in and it to play for for itself so and and i mean i was used to to search always um, to have um, all the notes equally and or in a legato in a long legato phrase and i mean all all these things uh, that i was searching of in the time there they was uh, for me not uh, not so much important and the instrument um it doesn't work it, it really it's 
it doesn't sound if you are not um, if you if you are not doing the right movement. So that's uh, for explain that uh, it's really um, effective to <laughs> to learn Baroque because uh, you can. I think, for my opinion, you can just uh, do it right because if it, it's wrong, the instrument will say you uh, immediately. Yeah, I'm not, maybe, I mean, I don't have to, to explain much about uh, Baroque techniques, so I try to be just general, <laughs> some general things. <laughs> Sumamente, sumamente interesante y recordar que hay posibilidades de que tengamos una clase maestra con eh, Francesca y poder profundizar un poquito. Sin embargo, eh, bueno, ya que se presenta la oportunidad, eh, quería preguntarle a Francesca, eh, eh, bueno, tal vez sea una, una pregunta muy amplia, pero siempre en las ediciones eh, de Bach, de las suites que, que usamos y los que no conocemos o no hemos profundizado, suficiente en la ejecución histórica. Tenemos dudas sobre eh, los pasajes que vienen editados, ligados, separados. Siempre, siempre pensamos o tenemos la duda o estamos moviéndonos entre si realmente Vaca había pensado muchos pasajes ligados o eran más separados aquellos eh, pasajes de semicorcheas. Y esto, por ejemplo, me estoy pensando en, la, en, la, en el preludio de la tercera suite. Entonces, si sobre esto hay alguna... Eh, algún concepto general que se pueda aplicar, ¿verdad? Y que eh, ella conociendo las ediciones nos pueda eh, dar luces. Ah, later. Oh, that's nice. Ah, in June, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, yeah, yeah. That would be the, the master, the master class, yeah. Ah. Y, y si es realmente posible en un instrumento barroco y un arco barroco hacer muchas frases grandes, muy ligadas, o era más bien eh, eh, la música se tocaba más, digamos, separado, habían ligaduras más cortas, un poco esa es la pregunta. Okay, 
the general rules uh, we can uh, explain like that um, use the manuscript every time it's possible fax uh, facsimile i don't know if the, the, the right um, or if you doesn't have the urtex uh, edition whatever it's possible that's the the first uh, thing uh, because you have to know direct to what the composer or the copies, because a lot of the time are not just um, the, the, the um, I mean, not a componist, a componista, um, but yeah, composer, but also the, the copist uh, do it. And what it's really important, I, I take choice because of the harmony actually. So in Baroque music, there is um, really constantly attention to the bass line. And also in the bass suite now, you have uh, the, bias, the bass voice and uh, the harmony there. So looking always what, uh, what the bass uh, do. All Baroque music is constructor from the, the bass and to bring out dissonance and weaken resolution and something like that. So that's really, really important to have the, I would not say the direction of the music because in this time, I don't think the music has a really direction, but it's, it's like this. So because of the harmony. Yeah. Yes. Yo. <laughs> hey, <Jeff. laughs> I um I, I feel a little shame about my question because it's, uh there's a lot of topics about this stuff. It's about our the tuning in Baroque. Um, some people say it's, it's four three five. Some people say it's, it's the four three everything, no? And and I and I like and I want to ask to you is your tuning. Ah, okay. So which pitch do you uh, uh -huh. you mean? No. Yeah, which pitch? Okay. For. Okay. Ah, sí. <laughs> sí, es que se me olvida que, que estamos hablando. De... <laughs> ok, me, me preguntas básicamente este, sobre la afinación, este, que, que es destinada para el barroco, porque todo, porque todo es en el, en el conservatorio de que para el barroco 45, pero algunos, algunos intérpretes este, le, le suben un poco más, le bajan un poco otro poquito más, entonces le estoy preguntando, o sea, que, que, ¿cuál es la afinación que hoy en día, 2021, este, utiliza ella que está en, en, en Frankfurt, ¿no? de, 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 que, está, que, y que está especializada en el barroco? ¿no? Eh, entonces, básicamente es lo que le pregunté. <ríe> ok. Um, I used to play in several pitch, but the must um, pitch that I used to play are um, 415, 15, and 430, that it's not so distant uh, from, <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Cuatro y tre, tre, treinta. Cuatro y treinta. 
Well, I, I mean, uh, for the pitch, uh, it's really difficult to say because we play in a standard pitch, but actually also what, uh, also what we decide, uh, we decide now that uh, when we play Baroque, we play at uh, 4.15 or 4.13. There are also, I, I would say, a standard modern pitch because um, in the Baroque era, um, there were a lot of, uh, of pitch, uh, so not just uh, 4.15 and 4.30. And now we are used to play in the Baroque, um, for the Baroque piece, uh, 4.15 and for the classical or late Baroque uh, piece, uh, then 4.30. Okay. But, <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so just uh, shortly, I would say um, in the Baroque time and the classical time, the pitch was uh, always, I mean, if you have to to play in a church with the organ and the organ have a, a pitch, you have to tune in this pitch. So that's why, and you know, in Germany, for example, there are many church and there was a lot of different pitch, so. Yeah, so, so people you know, different kind of pitch in every country. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. In you say some people say it's for for and uh, here in Mexico some people use four forty one. Yeah. <laughs> are you? Are you think this too? I... Yeah, yeah. It it was a mess. It was a mess also. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Well, um, I mean, uh, um, for example, if I play in uh, four fifteen, then I use the baroque bow, and um, when I play in four thirty, I I use both, but actually I use just um, the late baroque bow and um, my classical bow, um, and that's why I mean the classical bow. It's um, I I show you because maybe someone, you can translate, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. For example, I use this, this one, this late baroque bow. Um, that's the bow that I use when I used to play in 415 and also sometimes in 430. And the difference for me, it's uh, just, um, it's, uh, I can do more weight uh, if I play on 430, just the uh, only difference. And also the instrument, uh, it sounds more open, but that's my instrument. I mean, my viola sounds more open and I can just do more with more weight on the string. Yeah. Of course, but if, for example, if I play with this um, classical bow in 415, I can, um, it's, it's too, I mean, I have really uh, to take care to not pushing so much. So I just feel that it doesn't work really well together. So it's not just a question of the pitch of the instrument, but it's all, always a combination between the instrument, the pitch of the instrument and the bow, because the bow, it's, it's really important. Uh, so. Yes, we'll try. <laughs> it's like I'm selling some things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And maybe I can add something that, um, I mean, if you want to approach to the Baroque, the first rule for the bow is just to do slowly, not... Yeah, because if you if you put just the bow on the, I mean, I, I will I will take my viola now. So if you put just the, the bow on the street and and try to get faster, you will not receive uh, really a sound, uh, a beautiful sound. So for a beautiful sound, you have to swelling uh, a bit also. So to start, a, I don't know the microphone as it is, but just to. Try really to enter in the instrument, and we are used to play like okay, put the bow like this and and do this, but that's doesn't sound really interesting and not into the string. So the first things it just do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as always, uh, as a violist, I can suggest slowly is better. <laughs> <laughs> Francesca, please, can I ask you something? Yes, of course. Um, uh, it's me, Ellie. Oh, okay, Ellie. Uh, I I saw your uh, baroque bow. Uh, they have no uh, screw. Really? Is that okay? Because you 
you pressure uh, the I don't know. Ah, do you do you mean this? Uh, this yes. one? Yes. I have it. My ah. bow has yeah. My bow has the screw. I don't know if um, maybe because it's a late baroque, but yes, probably. Um, yeah. And so you don't have just uh, you don't have ah, to push with the thumb. Do yes. Okay. Or, Sí, yo le pregunté a Francesca si ella utilizaba un arco barroco con tornillo o sin tornillo, porque en el barroco temprano no tenían tornillo y la presión se hacía sobre las cerdas con el pulgar. Y me pareció ver un tornillo que tenía. Y sí, me dijo que sí, que, en, que su arco tal vez sea eh, de barroco tardío. That's um, that's a baroque bow. Um, I I think I can I can say from the middle of the um, um, okay. <laughs> yes, sorry, <laughs> not really good to read English. Yeah. And so I tried different times to play without the the screw. Yeah. Um, at the at the end, I did this, this decision also because if I had to play a concert, I felt me more comfortable to have it, okay. and um, be, because um, because of the humidity also. I mean, if it's uh -huh. raining or something, you have to adjust this. I mean, yes, the, yes. the way to play really with the thumb there, it's it's not just Baroque, it's just from a, a part, a, a region of Baroque. I think it's it's more the, how, how the, the French uh, were, was, were playing. Mm -hmm. so, um, um, so for me, it was also okay to, to use this, uh, as a late baroque violist so okay. and also because i am really um it was for me too risky to play on stage um, um with not uh being able to to have the the tension that i would uh, have yes so okay thank you <laughs> No, ella siguió explicando cómo funcionaba el arco eh, en relación a la tensión que se le da con el pulgar. Eh, y que para ella era más confortable tocar eh, con el tornillo, por más que sea un arco de barroco tardío, porque le da más confianza y seguridad. Eh, y que al apretar con el pulgar se, se dificulta más, y sí, eso es cierto. Of course. Okay. Then Thank you. Are... Thank you. <laughs> I don't have a question, but would you like to see a bow that has a clip in frog? Is that a... No, no, it's not a problem. It's a very important ver un arco. Sin, uh, sin schools. Sí. Uh, un, un, un yes, please. <laughs> so this is this is a, this is a baby um, arco, un arco de uh, música barroca temprano. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how you say the frog. This thing. Yes. Uh, it, it just comes out. Whoa, like that. And ah. the the advantage is that the um the hair yeah goes into this comes out of the stick or goes into the stick here and it also yes. goes into the stick here. Yeah, because in a modern bow it it goes in here, but here yes. it goes into the frog, so it never meets the stick again. Yeah. 
So, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know how you say the hair. How do you say the hair? Green. Green. green is. Sí. Sí. Del, 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 del uh, Madero. Madero. Eh, madera. Eh, mm -hmm. Regresa también en el Madera, directamente. Uh, um, en, en el arco moderno, regresa solo en el, uh, el frog, ¿ya? Yeah? Eh, por, por eso uh, la vibración de la, de, de la moderna es menos in, importante, menos interesante con uh, el arco moderno. Um, uh -huh. Porque la, la, la vibración es menos interesante. Y, um, es muy fácil uh, a veces um, regresar eso dentro. Um, no he hecho eso en en público antes. <laughs> ya, yeah. un, dos, tres, voila, echo. Ah, okay. And, and yes, it's, it's because it's very light bow, it's, it's muy ligero, y por eso um, es mucho más fácil tener uh, con el, uh, the thumb here, you see. It's, it's very yeah. easy. But if you have a bigger bow, like the one that Francesca is talking about, you can't really do that because it's too heavy. You, you learn, as Francesca says, you learn from the, the violin or the viola. <laughs> yes. You also learn a lot from the bow. Bow, bows yes. are very good teachers. Hey, yes. I, I didn't want to interrupt you, Francesca. But, uh, no, no, that was, uh, that was really nice that you show it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me parece que Emily tenía una pregunta. Hello, Francesca. Ah, hello. Hello. I have a question. I love the CD, and I'm curious about how you choose temperaments. How do you choose temperaments? I, you talk about pitch, but also, like, how do you choose temperaments for CPE Bach? And is that different than Flacton? And oh, yeah, how do you figure that out? Um, well, that's a good question. Because um, for the CD, I really made a compromise of the temperament um, because I wanted to play with three different um, instruments. Uh, so three different um, um, strumento tastiera, so two fortepianos and one harpsichord. I used the harpsichord for flecton, and um, so I played um, at. Um, so I used a, a harpsichord for flecton and um, uh, Cristofori Bartolomeo Cristofori uh, fortepiano for Giardini and um, Silberman. Um, for the piano, for for the three um, German one. <laughs> so, and that's why I really wanted to the combination between the the late baroque viola uh, with the late baroque instrument, because the two fortepianos are the the first fortepiano uh, that were born. In, in, in Europe, Europe and in the world. So I say that because in the fortepiano you have, uh, in this early fortepiano, you have just, um, there are instruments that con constantly get, um, so the, the, the intonation gets um, destroyed with the time. I don't know how to explain better. So you start to play with a fortepiano and the fortepiano in five minutes, it's not in tune anymore. And you have to record and you have just four days and you pay a lot of, uh, <laughs> of money for the recording. So I just uh, chose a, a pitch uh, um, that uh, we are, it's really common uh, for us here in Germany. There is uh, Valot Young. And I use it uh, for 
um, for every tuning uh, in the recording um, because I wanted uh, that the, um, the person who was in charge to tune was able to do it <laughs> and to maintain uh, the the harpsichord and the fortepiano in uh, in tune, so that's why. But Valotti Young, it's uh, it's really common here in Germany, um, um, but um, not just in a historical way. It just um, I, I'm not really expert of uh, temper temperament, but uh, it um, it's uh, it's all. It's almost late Baroque and it's really um, comfortable for us because it uh, it uh, it doesn't change uh, so much. I don't want now to to go into deep into specific uh, things. Um, but um, I I had uh, I mean I tried also to play Bach with Werkmeister. There is another temperament, and it was completely different for intonation. So you have really to get to use for of every temperament uh, that uh, you you are playing it. The, I I think the best way to play in different temperaments it just doesn't know that uh, the uh, what temperament you are going to to play just play and heard a little bit because otherwise uh, it will make you crazy uh, <laughs> to, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Valotti Young. Um, um, okay, so Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just basic things when you are going to tune your viola you automatically um, try to have the um, try that um, you mean you are Tune so in the best way to don't um, have uh, this. Uh, how can I say <laughs> that's really difficult uh, in English? <laughs> Maybe the the Walter can uh, can help me a bit <laughs> about this. So if you are tune uh, the fifth, um, actually. Um, the, uh, when you receive this, um, I mean, we we used to play in large fifth, uh, used to tune in large fifth, and it, yeah, and in the temperament, um, actually, we just um, tune um, with the harpsichord, for example, or with the bass. Um, um, every single uh, note, for example, A or D, uh, G and C. And not always this fifth are so large as we imagine. Someone the fifth are really... <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
That's um, I forgot forgot to say the most important thing. So actually, the temperament is just a compromise. It's a compromise between uh, some intervals that we have. And why we do this compromise? Because um, um, with the piano, you can just play every um, tone art, every every tonality, and it sounds okay. I would say it sounds good. So it sounds good. <laughs> And so we are just to adjust uh, with the with the piano, no? with this um, accompaniment. But um, an harpsichord, when you are tuning an harpsichord and you choose a temperament, it doesn't work for because it's a compromise. It doesn't work uh, for every pieces, and that's really important um, because. Actually, with some temperament, you can play wonderful in G major and maybe not really good in A flat major or something like that. So that's why, um, yeah, you can you can start to, to translate a bit. Shall, shall I explain, uh, everyone, um, help um, Francesca a little bit with, with because I think you're going to... Okay. Because your question originally was, um, what are we talking about? Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, going to try, I'm going to try and explain it um, uh, quite simply because it, it's mathematically and everything, it's very complicated, but we don't need to do the maths. If, if you tune in perfect fifths, quinta perfectos, yeah? If you tune in perfect fifths, you know if you tune in an orchestra in perfect fifths, and yeah. you have the the uh, the violas playing their perfect fifths and the cellos playing their, their perfect fifths and the violins also. Then you know that if you hear the bottom C of the the do of the cello and the top me of the violin, it sounds horrible. It sounds out of tune, right? And that's the problem when you have perfect fifths all the way up. Supposing you have a cycle of fifths. So do sol re la da 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 da. When you get to the next do, um, the two are not together. They're not in tune. That's the, that's the problem, and that's a problem of nature. Yeah, it's not it's not it's not a question of what what we do. Is that that's naturally. So Francesca is absolutely right to say about a compromise. We have to somehow find a way of uh, making our notes in tune with each other with some kind of compromise and each compromise involves slightly pushing the notes um together now we, we don't play with uh instruments that play with five octaves fortunately i don't think there are five octaves on a viola it's not not, not that i've heard <laughs> or, or on a violin for that matter um so um it, it's people have to find different systems and the ones that um that Francesca is talking about two examples, one of Werkmeister, who was actually a, a student of Bach, and um, the other, the, the young, the, the Valotti one, which is a compromise. But the important thing to remember, I think, is that um, in order to play in all possible tonalities, um, we uh, the, the solution that the, the, the piano tuners um, came up with, let's make a compromise of a different kind. So 
all the semitones, all the, the half tones are equal. That's called equal temperament. So all on a piano, every single semitone is exactly equal, which means that nothing is in tune. Yeah. It's a, it's a compromise, as Francesca says. Nothing is in tune. Um, but you can play in uh, A flat minor if you, and, or C major if you want, it's, it's, it's okay. So our ears are used to that. But with the Baroque tuning, it's actually entirely based on nature. It's based on uh, overtones. If you play, for example, um, a fourth and then a third, you can hear the overtone, the harmonic overtones. Yeah, that's the, the third sound that, 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 that Tartini discovered. And if you play according to those overtones, then you get different intonation than if you just say everything's equal, okay? We, we all like everything to be equal, but they're not. Um, which means that uh, a si bemol and a la diez, la, la sostenido, they're not the same note. On the piano, no. they're the same note, but on uh, in the natural intonation, they're not the same note, and th that's that's what makes it complicated. So, if you see, for example, a diagram of a violin from 1700, and it tells about the tunings, it says la, la diez, si bemol, si, etc. So, in other words. With the old temper, the old temperament, the flats are always going to be a little higher than with the equal temperaments, and the sharps are going to be a little lower than the modern sharps. I hope you're all very confused now. But as Francesca says, ultimately, um, it's the ear that counts. Edmundo, no quería agregar a tu explicación que bueno, eso es por la coma pitagórica que Bach aplica en el clave bien temperado. Entonces, el, el instrumento eh, queda todo afinado. Pero en los instrumentos no temperados, como el violín y cualquiera de, de cuerdas, tenemos ese problema que tenemos que escuchar la nota y adecuarnos al sonido del teclado. En este caso, el, el clavecín o, o el cordio. Mm. Claro. Yes. <laughs> ah, I want I want to say something about the temperament and just close the argument. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. Uh, no, I, I just want to add something that it's really interesting. Um in, in the past, uh, so the keys, every keys has a specific characteristic. And I think also because, of course, of also because of the temperament. So a lot of um, 
um, historical practice um, source, sources um, describe um, temperament, uh, so the keys, the character of the keys. So if we are going in to play in C major, uh, Matheson, and there's an, an, an um, I, I now I don't want to, to speak a lot, but it's a sort of a writer who described um, uh, how to play in, in Baroque times. So um, there is a book, uh, um, Das Neu Eröffnete Orchester, that's um, it's uh, the, the new uh, uh, orchestra. So uh, he wrote this tractise. And uh, he described uh, different keys and different characters. So C Mario, it's uh, it's uh, um, rejoicing, or D Mayor, it's uh, joyful, warlike, uh, something like like this. So, and I think it's really extremely connected to, with the temperament uh, because um, uh, if you are all always equal, it's a bit it's a bit different. You cannot really feel this, uh, this change of uh, character as with uh, with uh, different temperament also. So. Die neu eröffnete Orchester. <laughs> das neu. Yeah, I'm writing now. Uh, then... Okay. Eh, bueno, no, si no hay otra, eh, bueno, interesantísimo, como decía al principio, y eh, pues tomando muchas notas. El, el, el tema es cuando tratamos, y pensando un poco en la clase maestra, cuando tratamos de traducir todo esto en nuestros instrumentos, eh, con nuestros arcos, ¿qué tanto podemos hacer con nuestra viola, con nuestro arco, para asimilar un poco el sonido, sobre todo en el proceso de formación a los estudiantes, asimilar un poco el sonido y todas las características, el temperamento a la música barroca. O la otra opción sería no hacer nada en este sentido y, 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 y tratar de que suene dentro de las, del contexto de nuestro instrumento, ¿verdad? Con, con un, un sonido específico y eh, eh, con nuestro arco y la música que ya tocamos. Pero qué tanto, la pregunta es, qué tanto podemos hacer con nuestros instrumentos para eh, eh, lograr una interpretación más histórica.
Ah, okay. Well, well, I I will I would I mean I um, I would enjoy so much to play a, um, a baroque piece with a modern viola because I finally get shifting really quickly <laughs> without thinking so much. No, no, that's a joke. <laughs> No, no, that's just. I I think um, it's a it's a language. So the baroque music is just another language. So I think also if you are continue to play modern viola, um, and just and you you want just to study a bit of baroque, it can help to just to play in 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 the right way or have more freedom to interpreting something. So at which level, that's a, it's a personal thing. There are people. Yeah. Yeah, of course, if you, if you, I mean, if you don't, don't have the possibility also to have a Baroque instrument, so a proper one, I mean, also just using the bow, you can have another uh, articulation and you can learn a lot uh, actually about uh, how to do slurs and articulation. Of course, uh, a Baroque instrument helps so much because it's answered immediately, um, but also without it, it, it just, yeah, it's something, it's really, I mean, there are some basic things that uh, you will learn and you can bring really not just to Baroque music, but for all your music, because I mean, we play in a modern way, but we, uh, when we play, I mean, it's not just a baroque. It's just the idea of uh, of playing in a um, um, if just to play informed. It's not just with the baroque because we can do it also with the classical period. We can do also with the romantic period. Uh, it's just um, to change the way of thinking. Think it's it's not just from baroque this performance practice. So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, basicamente, yeah. Yeah, because I mean also, eh, basicamente. <laughs> I recognize something similar to Italian, so oh yeah, basicamente, I know it. No, it just also, I mean, if, if I would be just uh, just a modern violist, I would uh, use uh, the Baroque uh, point of view to learn something about ornamentation. So how how to do the trill or something that you can use uh, always with uh, you know, especially if you are leading an orchestra or a group of the of the orchestra, you have to be really informed about how to do the trill there or or something. And uh, and I mean also for uh, some slurs, they are really 
complicated to do with uh, with a modern bow because if I have a slurs like um, three notes uh, and then one, I mean, if I have to do something like like this, yes. Yes. So if, uh, for example, if I do just, I, I play a bit slowly because of the connection. So it just, yeah. So I, I have three notes in a slurs and then one one just up. And I can imagine with the mortar, but it's really difficult to just, uh, to to you have to control everything and you can it's difficult to let it jump from from so just to, something like this yeah it's it's really a little example that can explain a lot of music, for example, of Bach and the way how we play it. Because if you made, imagine the suite of Bach, ta -da -di -da -di -da -di -da, or the first or the sixth, uh, I remember the sixth suite of Bach, I just wanted to, ta -da 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 -da, to jump it uh, and I couldn't do it really well because, uh, because the bow, what's really heavy, it was really heavy, it was a modern bow and with a modern viola, but I just really wanted to do this movement. But so there are things that uh, it comes from alone with uh, just using the bow, you can experiment a lot uh, more that you can imagine, so. Yeah, for example, um, what I think it's really interesting um, when you get into the source and you read books about Baroque componists and uh, so, for example, the art of playing the violin of Geminiani, uh, you, I, I will write, write you uh, because it's also in uh, uh, International Mrs. Choral Library, you can find it. Um, you have really the idea of the taste of this uh, era. So, and it's really interesting because um, we define, I mean, if you play a modern instrument, a modern viola, and you have to play equal, every tone it's equal. And uh, Geminiani said uh, really some times ago, no, it's, if it's equal, it's, it's bad, no, <laughs> cattivo. So it's just a little example because um, he said something that it's, it sounds good, something uh, uh, that uh, when you can, for example, swelling the sound so have a crescendo for example so when the the note every tone get a shape you know and uh, it's really important because i think now um we are not we are a bit um 
we are not really asking to this uh, shape of the sign. So it's uh, something that you can also bring in your music with a modern violin to think uh, viola, so to think about the shape of the note, uh, to really do crescendo and diminuendo, and not just uh, let the the end uh, so with vibrato to express. I mean, it's also nice. I love uh, do vibrato also, and it, but it's just an example. I'm not again the vibrato, but it's just an example because we are a lot of uh, kind of way to express ourselves, and that's uh, for example getting uh, close to the baroque music give us some more information about them. So. Can I add something to that? Do, do you allow me, Francesca, just to say of that? Of course. <laughs> yeah. No, because I think that the problem is much more basic than that, although you're absolutely right, what, everything that you've said, I agree with. But um, the, the basic thing, there, there, there are several basic things, but the basic idea is that the romantic music that we have all grown up on as a, is a completely different aesthetic and is written in a completely different way. And that's the problem. And the, the romantic conception is really one of unfettered uh, uh, legato and melody. And the problem is that uh, a lot of Baroque music is not melody. You'll have to look quite hard in either the viola or the, rather the cello book or the violin book um, to find a real tune, something you can kind of sing that is a melody. In fact, in the violin book, the, the six, the, the three sonatas and the three partitas, there are only two tunes, the slow movement of the C major sonata and the slow movement of the A minor sonata, which are really melodies with a kind of bass accompaniment. And so what is the rest? Well, some of it's dance. And if you if you have a dance and you play it like a song, then it must be wrong, right? And the rest of it is, is more like speech, what we call rhetoric, what they call rhetoric. And there again, that's why Francesca is talking about the, the importance of, of articulation. By articulations, what, what I think you, you mean, Francesca, is, is the actual quality of a stroke. So the idea that strokes must be long and singing that's fine for some music, but it's absolutely not fine for this kind of music because it's not melodic. It's much more like speech. So, you know, if I started talking like that, you, you don't think I was crazy, but that's kind of what, what, what the, the principal mistake, if I may say so, that we, 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 we make when we try and use our post-romantic aesthetic and technique for playing music that is not of that kind. It's a completely different kind. It's a little bit like me talking English to somebody who doesn't understand it, or you talking Spanish to someone who doesn't understand it. It's a completely different language. I think that's that's the important thing. And and the bow is absolutely, as Francesca has said so many times, is, is absolutely key to that because the bow needs to, to speak. And the modern way of playing is that the bow doesn't speak at all. It, 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 it's replaced by this non-stop vibrato, which doesn't allow it to speak. I think that, that, that's the sort of fundamental reason, if you ask me, why do we do what we do? Well, because you, you can't um, uh, translate the post-romantic idiom into a pre-classical idiom. So, and, and the other thing I wanted to say, if you, if, you've, if you just allow me a little bit of time, is that, and it's, and it's and it, okay. It, it's it's related to that, is that we in the twenty first century were actually 
not living in the 21st century. We're living somewhere in sort of 1850 or something like that. So we, from the very beginning of our studies, you know, we play those wonderful concertos of reading, and then we go on to Zeitz and Bruch and Mendelssohn and all that. It's all about romanticism. And we don't actually learn very much Baroque music at all. Yeah, so it's our aesthetic is always to the sort of mid 19th century or mid 20th century where the sort of menu in Stern school, that's what we emulate, that's what we try and copy. And that has absolutely nothing to do with, with, with um, the kind of writing and the aesthetic of, of, of the Baroque. And the last thing I want to say, because it's not my talk, uh, is about that um, you're always talking about Bach. You know, Bach is at the absolute, the, the end of the Baroque period. And this is one of the, the, the problems I'm sure Francesca's obviously aware of, that Bach himself, he spent all his life copying out music from other composers from French composers and Italian composers and contemporary German composers. And he did that because he wanted to find his own musical language and feed off the past. He, he, he copied some very early um, uh, uh, composers, even Frescobaldi and people like that at the beginning of the 17th century. He knew all that repertoire and he copied it all. And his style um, is a kind of, uh, combination of so many different things and we don't learn that music in conservatories they don't teach us that they kind of censor it they say this is not real music Brahms Schumann is real music and, and this is kind of you know uh, Rameau is uh, is something completely different so it's, it's almost as if this early music thing is it's not real music it's something different it's something pre-music yeah the music begins with the classics and then goes on to its final fruition in the romantic time. And that's one of the problems of, 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 of learning uh, about Bach is that we start with Bach. We should actually finish with Bach. We should start in 1600. We do start in, don't we, Francesca? We, so we do start in 1600 and eventually we get to Bach and we're very happy when we get to Bach. But to sort of talk about, um, uh, because yeah, Bach wrote stuff for, for, for cello, which we can play on the viola, that's very nice. But actually the viola is a really important instrument in Baroque music. In French music, it was um, uh, the, uh, actually three types of viola, you know, little big and bigger to give them their technical names. And um, they uh, and that music is very important. And the, also the music of Bieber and Schmelzer and people like that, Mufat, where there are three viola parts. So there's one bass part, one top part, and three viola parts. And we don't play that music. We go straight to Bach, because he's the one, he's the one with the, the guy with the, his name in lights over the over the concert hall. That's what I wanted to say. Don't start <laughs> Bach. Start in 1600 and learn all about and there's so many baroque styles we talk about baroque style but you know styles changed from from 1600 to 1750 they changed uh, every decade you know even Bach he, he was out of date wasn't he, he I, I want to tell you one story which I love um uh Mozart went to Leipzig yeah to 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 direct the um, Gewandt House Orchestra, it already existed then. And um, they asked him, do you know the music of Bach? And he said, of course I know the music of Bach. And they said, no, 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 not Carl Philip, his father. And Mozart said, no, he didn't know, he didn't know Bach. And so they said, well, would you like to see some? And they pulled out of a little cupboard, some motets and Mozart, dropped to his knees and he said finally I have a master who can teach me something and the reason I tell you that story apart from the fact it's a great story is that um, Bach was already out of date in his time because Carl Philip his son was writing in a completely different style and also um, Johann Christian his other son writing in a, another completely different style and styles changed 
all the time, which is why Baroque music is so interesting. That's why we love it, isn't it, Francesca? Is that there's just so much. And the French music and the Italian music and the German music, they're all completely different and all completely wonderful. And then you get to Bach at the end of the journey. <laughs> so have, have a great journey. <laughs> yes. Buen viaje. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, actually, it's it's really it's yeah okay <laughs> okay. You did perfectly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, I mean, um, as um, um, uh, Walter said, the, the, the Baroque, it's really um, incredibly uh, different. No, there are a lot of Baroque styles, and what I personally did, it's um, I want to get in deep with the late Baroque era, uh, especially not Bach, but after Bach. <laughs> so with uh, Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach, or uh, I love German composer. Um, I mean, we uh, we describe this era like a gallant style 
let's uh, let's not get too deep into it, but we we just say okay, we can describe gallant. I mean, for me, also Telema, it's uh, Telemann, it's a gallant uh, composer. And um, I choose this period uh, to get in, into it because um, there are a lot of beautiful composition uh, for viola. And uh, most important things, uh, this composition are originally, I mean, originally written for viola. And that's what's, uh, what is fascinating me. There are a lot of viola concertos, a lot of viola sonatas uh, in this period. And I mean, of course, uh, Stamitz concerto or um, Hofmeister, um, it's also interesting <laughs> to, to play, um, but there are a lot of, um, of other uh, composers. Um, I had um, I'd written a short list because if I would just write just the um, viola sonata or viola con concerto in uh, just the gallant style, I had to write like uh, a doctor, and that's why I I, I will <laughs> I'm doing now. So it's really it, it's really a lot more more uh, much more that you can imagine but i wanted just to suggest you some piece that you can uh, actually find uh, in internet um, yeah 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 so maybe yeah but it just uh, i mean i just I wrote just but it's 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 okay. I have it and I can share with you. Okay. Yes. I just need the um, because I'm not allowed to share something. Listo, ya es co-host. Ok, perfect. So, I will try to do that because I'm, <laughs> I'm really, really excited. Ok, uh, I think that that's... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> ok, here I have something. No, I don't have here. Mm -hmm. Just um, uh, so maybe in downloads sometime more than a book. Viola list, yes. I I just want to say it's not a complete list. I just wrote uh, some pieces that I like. So my favorite Baroque viola list. But the most important things it's I. Um, wanted to do a list of pieces that you can easily reach and have. So you can see there, there is in the, um, I wrote uh, in blue uh, international music score library project. So you can find what I wrote on EMS SLP. So that's, uh, that's the most important thing. I can also, send you scores if you need i mean you have you can buy of course you have to buy score but if you if it's too slowly to to have it i can i can send you something so um, Thank you. i just um i mean what's it helped me to begin it was this um, method from um, michelle corrette 
you can find two viola sonatas, maybe you, you know, there is also a viola duos and a viola sonata with bass accompaniment. Uh, so to, yeah, um, it's, it's French, but actually he wrote this piece in, a, in, a, in Italian style, so don't take it as a French example. And then I read uh, with, uh, I, fit, I, I mean, for me, it was really interesting to read um, the art of playing the violin. And there is a transposed uh, version for viola and it's really well done. Oh. You, uh, and you can, um, you can um, find uh, here uh, scales with bass accompaniment, really good for learning temperament. If you have the occasion to experiment with a harpsichordist, you can use it and exercise and you have, um, a beautiful composition, really beautiful. And there is some recordings also in internet and uh, a lot of recording actually. Uh, so you can also hear uh, has, uh, has, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Yes, yes, that's the most interesting thing that you can play on the viola without transposing every time. And also exercise, I don't know where, who wants to join the master class um, the next time, but there are also some exercise to doing shift. So you can experiment a bit, and then we can uh, we can do it together next time. Yes. Okay, so um, um, after you have some uh, some studies, etudes, uh, there are uh, so late Baroque and early classic things, but there are really interesting for viola, viola duos. Um, I'm just um, doing. Um, um, okay, so now we have um, different sonatas that uh, I think it's really interesting. What I personally, um, what I think it's really interesting, it's these, uh, these uh, sonatas from Giorgio Antoniotto. Um, he wrote two sonatas. The first one, it's really nice um, because of, uh, you can learn a bit of the abolishment and, and so on. And uh, <laughs> it's a crazy sonata, it's really nice. And um, about Antoniotto, it, I don't know so much because you cannot find a lot of information about him. So it's an Italian and he wrote in a bit uh, like mixed one, Baroque and Gallant style. So, uh, mm -hmm. I am sorry, uh, George Antoniotto and Artus is the edition. So I all
Mm -hmm. I'm working on it, of course, about the information now, but uh, you can uh, you can reach uh, this sonata, you can order, there is this Artus uh, edition, they are really good, but if you need a uh, spoiler, I can send you some things so privately. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to, to say something like that. Yeah. Okay, so don't tra translate. Um, then you have the trio sonata in G minor um, of um, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach. Uh, that's the sonata that I recorded. Um, so that's um, a really big example to try in deep into the style of Empfindsamkeit and uh, this this German gallant style, uh, let's uh, say something like that. I, I love this sonata because actually it was auto authorized uh, from, uh, so it, it's for Viola da Gamba, but actually um, Ka Philippe Emanuel Bach uh, authorized a copy uh, for the viola. So that's really important because it's the only one No, ju just because <laughs> it's the only uh, original viola sonata that we have. Uh... <laughs> okay, and so um, Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, uh, there is a trio sonata in C minor that I can also highly recommend it, and you can find also several recording of it. Then another one uh, in yellow here, this Franz Bender Sonata. Uh, yeah, Franz Bender, um, it, um, that there are all, all, I mean, Franz Bender and uh, uh, together with uh, Janic and Graun, they worked at the court of uh, Friedrich, uh, Friedrich the Zweite, Friedrich the Great. And uh, there are a lot of companies who worked uh, for him and who um, actually wrote uh, original pieces uh, for viola. So, and uh, at the court of uh, uh, Friedrich uh, the Great, um, um, there was uh, actually a lot of uh, fortepianos. The early fortepiano was there when Janic and Ka Philippe Emanuel Bach and other were composing this piece. So it's interesting because, um, um, because there are the first uh, actually original pieces for viola written also with uh, an accompaniment, not only with the apsichord, but also with the fortepiano. So I, I, it's really interesting because it, the, the sound, it, it was changing. <laughs> so, um, So, Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, um, Franz Bender, uh, Luigi Boccherini wrote a sonata. Um, it's not sure that it's original for viola, but I can suggest you to, to try it out. It's really, it's really nice, actually, and it's uh, on International Mrs. Core Library Project. Um, Gaetano Brunetti. Um, well, it's a it's a Spanish one. It's not uh, it's not Italian, I think, or it's in, in Italian. Was born in, in Spain, and he worked uh, uh, also at the court in um, in Madrid, and uh, he wrote a, a nice sonata. So correct. To And also Domenico Dall'Oglio, an Italian one, wrote this sonata in E flat major. 
the lawyer. Yeah, and you can order by edition Musedita. It's yeah. and uh, William Flecton, you know, I just wrote these uh, three sonatas that you can find on MML SLP. But actually, you can, uh, he wrote uh, um, two or three more sonatas for viola. But uh, if you want immediately to get into it, uh, I would suggest uh, to these three sonatas, especially the fourth, of course, and the sixth. And uh, yes, and uh, um, Johann Gottlieb Graun. Uh, it's also a German composer who work uh, at the court of Friedrich the Great, and uh, actually it's my um, um, favorite uh, componist. <laughs> so I like very much and it's really, really nice to get into the ornamentation in late classical music. You can find everything there. And uh, it's quite challenging to play it also. So I would recommend that uh, there are a lot of, yeah, there are a lot of uh, sonatas of him. So I think six sonata or five or six, but I just uh, wrote what you can immediately find on MLS, uh, um, uh, International Music Score Library Project. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I wrote. I, no, ah, yeah. Philippe de Lotry. Yeah, it's quite interesting too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Spanish composer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Together with uh, Gaetano Brunetti. Yeah, and also yeah. Fun um, about uh, George Philippe. Telemann, uh, we have not only the viola concerto, there is a canon sonata, so there is a sonata actually original oh. for viola, and you can make, oh. yeah, and you can make also. Uh, canon sonata so it's it's actually you can play as a duo or you can play as uh, yeah as a duo with uh, bass accompaniment, but also as a duo. So yeah, yeah, it's. A I mean, it's original just because he brought like flute or uh, viola da gamba or viola. So he <laughs> just wrote for a lot of instrument. And I mean, it's it's not bad also to use um, sonata that it's not original because at the, in the Baroque time, they used to play pieces for viola da gamba too with viola players. So it's just because I am, I'm doing this uh, research uh, that I... Yeah. And um, Felice Giardini, uh, I also recorded this piece because it's an Italian one and I like it very much. And uh, and I mean, I, it's really a piece that you also play with modern viola and enjoy enjoy a lot. Uh, so um, you can also try to to play with the normal bow. So I used to play with the Baroque, late Baroque also, also with the with the classical bow, this piece is so it's uh, really fine. Um, Christian Michael Wolf wrote a, a sonata. Um, you can also Google then, and you you will uh, you will find the edition because I didn't write here. So that's also an original one, a German one. And then for Janic, uh, Johann Gottlieb Janic, um, actually the sonata that I played of Janic. Um, I made the, the, the scores. Um, it's um, um, the most interesting things about uh, Sonata of Janic and Graun, and it's that you can also play as a trio sonata. So you have these uh, two possibilities. You can play with a violin uh, and a bass, uh, I mean, a harpsichord, or you can play just with a harpsichord, or fortepiano or uh, piano. So, um, 
if you need to have the score, uh, I can send you. And I can also recommend you a trio sonata in G uh, minor for violin, viola, and basso continuo. That's really a trio sonata, and so it's it's really nice to do it. So, but if you are searching for more pieces, um, I want to uh, suggest this platform. It's called um, um, www.musicforviola.info. It's it's really well made. I know a lot of people who work at there, and there are also musicologists who work at there, and they made a great work. So, and then, uh, I mean, you can search. Uh, um, I mean, it's it's not just uh, about the Baroque uh, or Gallant or late Baroque, whatever. It's uh, about the viola repertoire, but uh, the, the the Baroque part are really really well made, so you can find everything what you want. Uh, um, Vuvu um, music for viola, or and you write uh, as a number. Puedo hablar un segundo su mi libro. Hmm. Oh, sorry. Yes, I'm I'm, I'm trying to find the uh, the link. Like. There we are. I've just sent the link. Oh, yes. Thank you. So th th this this is a book that took me about 10 years to write. Um, not because I was doing only that, but other, other things too. But um, it's really a step-by-step -step guide to learning from zero to, actually to Bach, because that's the end, as I said, that's the end of the book. Um, and as far as the viola player is concerned, um, it's actually all about violin music, but all the music is also um, transcribed for viola so that you have more pieces to play. Um, and it's very much a step-by-step -step guide. So it starts with the very basics, how to, how to hold the instrument, how to hold the bow, how to use the bow. It talks about articulation, it talks about temperament, it talks about rhetoric, but it's actually built around specific pieces. So there are pieces from really from 1600 until Bach. Um, I actually don't know how many pieces there are, but um, some of them have many uh, pages devoted to them. And apart from the sort of general cultural background, there are um, observations, so basically bar by bar analysis, if, if anyone's got the patience to go through every single bar, and um, it, with, with my suggestions about, about articulation, about all sorts of things to do with interpretation. So it's basically a summary of the way I've been teaching for the last um, X years, about 30, I guess. Um, and I wrote it for so because there's nothing else quite like this. Yeah, you, you want to translate? Oh, sorry, I, I didn't express myself in Spanish. But um, it. Yeah. Something like that.
Okay, yeah, it, it really is a way of learning the instrument. Sin ir al conservatorio, sin, and and it's it's really an, as an A to Z tutor. It actually teaches you step by step what to do, how to do. Paso paso, yes. Yeah, so that um, it starts with the basics: como tener el instrumento, como tener el arco, con mucho información. Are you? You're translating. You're translating from bad Spanish to good Spanish. That's that's good. Well, then, I'll, <laughs> then I'll go in English. Um, um, and it's hung around different composers, so there are actual pieces that you learn from very easy, simple pieces from the the early um, 17th century, right through via um, Corelli, Vivaldi, but also the early Italian composers, so Fontana, Castello, um, Pandolfi, Miale, um, and then the French music of uh, Couperin and the early sonata. Yes, and then and then and it it, it has lessons on temperament. It had lessons on uh, five lessons on ornamentation, um, and on rhetoric. Basically, everything that I teach my students um, in about two years at the conservatory, you can learn um, in the comfort of your own home. And of course, you can always contact me if you need any extra information. Okay. Yes. <laughs> the first one, and and yeah, yeah, it was it's, it was really really helpful. That why that's why I was so happy to see him. Like, wow, <laughs> it's real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Likewise. Thank you, Walter. Very well. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I can send you a, a list of pieces which I recommended. I mean, for for these lessons, so pieces that you can also prepare in uh, two three weeks, uh, so not so. And to approaching, of course, we will have not the the piano accompaniment, so the harpsichord accompaniment. So I will. Uh, I will try to to figure out uh, what uh, what we can play together. So I'm will very happy to to start uh, this uh, this uh, new adventure with you with you. So yeah, yeah, really really nice because I mean at 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 the end we have to play to <laughs> to understand really. <laughs> What it's working, what is not uh, not working. So um, we'll happy to see you there. <laughs> if I can get together with, oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> yes.
Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. <laughs> it was really a pleasure. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Thank you everyone. Walter. Uh, thank you, Walter, as well. Welcome. Thank you. Lovely to meet you all. And lovely to meet you, Francesca. We'll, we'll chat further, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd love to. <laughs> Great. Interesting. Everything else. Okay.